Uh, greetings. A pragmatic approach to adverse events during endoscopy, especially colonoscopy. <clears throat> I would like to focus on two aspects with special reference to endoscopic mucosal resection. I would like to present a case of bleeding and another case of perforation and I'll do my best to help you with some take home messages that will assist you in your practice. Let's focus on bleeding management with special reference to flat lesions. Here is a case. This is a patient with a large non-polypoidal lesion in the cecum. So once you see this, you want to ask yourself two important questions. Is there cancer? And if not, is the lesion in a dependent position. How do you figure out whether the lesion is dependent or not? And why is it important to figure it out? By flushing water and finding out that the lesion is submerged, as you can see in this case, you can easily make a conclusion that the lesion is in a dependent position. The reason it is important to find out whether a lesion is dependent or not is because if bleeding were to happen after resection, you will not be able to find that bleeding vessel as it all gets submerged in a pool of blood. So how do you take care of this problem? The simple trick is to rotate the patient. If the patient is in the left lateral position, you, keep the pa you make the patient go to either supine or in some cases, right lateral position. And let's see what happens in this case. So we rotated the patient to supine position and it made all the difference. The fluid moved away and the lesion became non-dependent. And if bleeding were to happen, you can easily find the bleeding source. So we went ahead and did endoscopic mucosal resection in a piecemeal fashion. After resection of the second piece, we noted bleeding, an arterial spurter. This could be controlled with a snare by changing the settings on your electrosurgical generator to soft coagulation. Or you could also control this lesion, this bleeding with the help of a coagulation grasping forceps. While your assistant is bringing those, uh, making arrangements for you to take care of it, you could use the cap to apply tamponade and control bleeding as shown here. So we decided to use a hemostatic forceps and the steps include you open the forceps, find the bleeding spot, close the forceps, confirm that there is no bleeding and then apply soft coagulation with 60 watts after tenting the vessel up. When we remove the forceps as you can see, we did not make any difference. In this case, you go back and reapply the same steps. You could also increase the setting to 80 watts as we have done. And after achieving hemostasis and reopening the blades, before you pull the forceps out, you checked for bleeding and there was some more bleeding and then we applied another application of soft coagulation. 
with another 80 watts. And with this third attempt, we were able to control the bleeding successfully. As you can see here, this is a, a one to two millimeter vessel that was successfully controlled with soft coagulation using a hemostatic forceps. Let me take you to a summary. Let me share with you some of the take home messages from this case. The first step is check the lesion. Is this cancer or not? If it is not cancer, before you undertake resection, you ask yourself whether the lesion is dependent or not. If it is in a dependent position, submerged under fluid, make sure you rotate the patient to let the lesion come out into a non-dependent position so that if bleeding were to happen, you can find that bleeding spot easily. This is a very important step I want you to keep in mind. Also, get into the habit of putting a cap whenever you're doing EMR, and a cap will be of great assistance to apply tamponade while your technician is getting your equipment ready or changing the settings on your electrosurgical generator. When it comes to using a hemostatic forceps, the steps include Find the bleeding spot, open the jaws, close the jaws onto the bleeding spot, confirm tamponade and hemostasis, and before you apply soft coagulation, tent the vessel a little bit up, away from the submucosa. The coagulation setting is typically soft coagulation, effect 4, anywhere between 60 to 80 or in some cases 100 watts can be applied and after you apply soft coagulation reopen the forceps do not remove the forceps stay there check for cessation of bleeding before you remove the forceps so we have learned a lot of steps and a lot of uh, tricks in management of bleeding of a flat lesion in the cecum so next let me take you through an EMR perforation, how to treat it, and how to prevent it. Uh, I should make a confession here. Uh, this is my only perforation in the last uh, 20 years of my practice as a colonoscopist. And fortunately, I recorded this uh, video and I've learned a lot by dissecting it out. And let me do the dissection again to tell you what I've learned from this case. As you can see here, this is a gentleman who has leukemia and a flat lesion, uh, previously attempted uh, removal, but uh, not successful. This is a laterally spreading non-granular tumor, which is at high risk for perforation. It extends over a couple of folds. Another feature that suggests that anything that goes over a fold is also at high risk for perforation. And lesions in the transverse colon are also at high risk for perforation. So something to keep in mind, the location, the type of the polyp, and in relation to the folds when you're trying to do the resection and be careful to avoid perforation. So we try to look for scarring and uh, find the scarring and try to inject away from this. But unfortunately, despite my attempts to find the scarring and try to inject at a nice spot, I was not able to create a nice submucosal bleb. Instead, we created a mucosal bleb, indicating that that area has submucosal fibrosis. In that case, you go away from the scar and repeat another injection. And as you can see here, we are able to get into the submucosal plane. And once you get into the submucosal plane, inject as much as you want till you get a good lift. Try to inject at one spot and make the most out of that. As you can see here, 
Uh, this fold that goes from left, uh, from right to left, indicates that there may be some submucosal fibrosis tethering that fold. Something to keep in mind. Next, when you apply a snare, usually when there is no submucosal fibrosis, you're able to tent the snare, the closed snare away from the wall. But in this case, after we close the snare, as you can see here, instead of tenting it up, the snare sank into the lesion with fluid-filled cushion on either side of the lesion uh, as mounts. This is another feature to keep in mind and make you think that there may be submucosal fibrosis. We went ahead and did the resection using Endocut Q313 and uh, you have to make it a habit after each resection to check if the base looks blue that means it is limited to the submucosa. We completed the remaining uh, half of the resection using Endocut Q313. So after completion of the resection, we went ahead and examined the base. It's important to examine the base to define the depth of resection. An elegant study recently published in GUT from Michael Burke's group suggested that if you see blue, you should be happy, that is submucosa. If you see anything white in the center, that means there is a muscular injury or scar tissue. And obviously, if there's a hole, you can identify the hole in the center. Once you find that there is a perforation, the next step is to make sure that the patient has no tension pneumoperitoneum. If that happens, you stop the procedure, you don't pull the scope out, you decompress the abdomen with a large bore angiocant, and then come back and close the perforation. Uh, in this patient, there was no tension pneumoperitoneum, and then we noticed that there is a little more uh, polyp tissue left in the lower edge. We went ahead and did the resection quickly, and then we also went ahead and uh, ablated the edge with APC to prevent any local recurrence. As long as there is no tension pneumoperitoneum, you can go ahead and take care of the polyp till it is completely resected. After the resection, you apply clips, and you want to apply clips starting at one edge, slightly away from the resection margin, and that allows the edges to tent up, and uh, as you apply the next clips, you want to make sure you create a deep approximation so that you don't see any gap in between the two blades of the clip. One thing to keep in mind is every clip retracts as you close. So you should ask your assistant to close slowly so that you can push the clip forwards or the scope forwards and compensate for that retraction. And after closure, you want to make sure and confirm that approximation of both edges were done by the clip. And it's possible sometimes the clip may hang on to one wall and uh, you may be fooled by that. So let's uh, uh, summarize what we have learned in this case. It's important to recognize lesions that are at high risk for perforation laterally spreading round granular tumors, those that extend over folds, and those that are located in the transverse colon are at a higher risk for perforation. Important to find out where the scar is and inject away from the scar so that you can find space into the submucosa and get a good lift. Following resection, every resection, you want to make it a habit to identify the depth of the resection. If perforation were to happen, you should be prepared to close the defect. And if you don't know how to close the defect, I suggest and recommend highly to learn how to close defects by attending one of the KSGE courses. Thank you.